Welcome to Black Man Lab. We are live Monday, June, excuse me, July 12th. Uh, we are happy to be here. This is going to be our last of doing this in this forum tonight. Um, next week, we will go back live and then we will have another forum that we will be on streaming live. And we'll talk about that later as well. But tonight will be our last after a Man, uh, we got my brothers Molly and, and Joe on with me. We've been doing this for our since the beginning of COVID. So this has become kind of regular for us, but uh, we look forward to getting back to being live and in person and, and being in the same space as one another. So tonight we have a great uh, cast of panelists tonight, and we're gonna be talking about violence in our community. But before that, uh, I wanna make sure I introduce uh, my two fellow board members, as well as co-founder, um, Maoli Davis. Maoli, how you doing, brother? What's up, brother Marty? What's up, brothers? Good to have brothers from the uh, Chicago and the ATL here to address this issue of community violence, man. We are grateful for you all to be here, so for us to have this conversation, um, and just to give everybody a little backdrop as to what the Black Man Lab is and what it's all about is that we really just started as a group of fathers, Black men who wanted to make sure that their sons were getting good information from Black men who we trusted and believed in. And so we started reaching the brothers and we started it uh, about five years ago now, just gathering at our law firm, then gathering at Sankofa Church, and then ultimately getting to the Andrew and Walter Young YMCA and just pulling young brothers, their fathers, grandfathers together so that we could create a safe and sacred space, a space where black men could just be, where we could be vulnerable, we could be honest, where we could be truthful with each other and where we could show each other love and support uh, in ways that this society typically does not uh, endorse. So uh, we endorse this. And so we're grateful that we have been able to build and we're grateful for our guests tonight and for the work that Brother Marty and Joe have been able to sustain during COVID. It's been difficult, um, but these brothers have, have held the banner, kept it, kept us going. And so now um, it's time to get back in person. So we're hopeful we'll be able to get some of our folks to fly in for these Monday sessions and, and kick it with us um, and just vibe with these young, young brothers and that are looking for uh, love in all the right places. So with that, thank you brothers. And I'm looking forward to this conversation. I know that uh, brother Kine Walker is uh, gonna be jumping in in a moment as well. So uh, it'll be strong. Absolutely. Thanks brother Molly. And um, we, again, we've done this now for since the beginning of COVID and uh, this has definitely served a purpose in us being able to reach from even outside of Atlanta to bring brothers, good, strong brothers into the space um, about touching the lives of our young black men. So we're really excited about that. Um, also with me tonight is my brother, partner in crime, who's been doing this with me since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, my man, Joe Barker. Joe is one of our, uh, our board members for Black Man Lab as well. And uh, it's been steadfast in doing this work every week. So, Joe. Hey, man, how's it going, man? Glad to be on here with everyone. We have a, we have a difficult but a needed conversation tonight, you know? Um, you know, it's funny because this topic, man, it, it raises it raises eyebrows in communities throughout the country, right? You know, it, there's some guys that I thought about having on the panel and they have different views of, of what this means and how we resolve it. So, you know, I love the topic. I love the, the panelists that we have on and I love the, the energy. You know, it's, it's going to be really exciting to be back in person. Um, and, and Marty, a little bit later as we get into it, I'm excited for us to kind of explain to them this new space that we're going to enter in addition to being in person. Uh, so really excited about that, man. Appreciate it. Absolutely. And uh, Joe, since we got you, man, um, why don't we get started and, and you can start us off with uh, getting us centered uh, so that we are able to take into in this information tonight and, and, and have open minds and open hearts. So if you could do that, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. 
one of the one of the things I'm excited about getting back in person is getting back to this with 50, 100, however many people we have that we can allow there. Getting back to being in space with one another and centering ourselves on one another in a space that allows us to receive the the intellectual conversations that take place and just kind of brush off all of the stress and the strife that maybe we started the week with, maybe we carried in from, from last week, you know. So what we're going to do now in, in, in historic vein and, and that and what we'll take on in, in person next week, we're going to center ourselves. We're just going to take some deep breaths that will allow us to be in this space calmly, center ourselves, and just think about what this topic really is and really have some active listening capacity to be with one another as we have this conversation. So with that, what we'll do is we'll take a couple of deep breaths. On the count of three, I will just ask you all to inhale deeply. One, two, three. Hold that at the top and then exhale. And just let all of the, the stress and the negative vibes and the negative energy that tries to stick to us throughout the days, uh, let it roll off and let's bring in this positive energy. So with that one more, we're gonna do, uh, let's take a deep breath. One, two, three. Exhale. Let those lungs clear all that out, breathe in some positivity, and let's get ready to bring the ancestors into the room. Thank you, Brother Joe. Appreciate that, man. As always, it's important for us to be of clear mind and clear heart so that we can be open to taking in great information uh, so often that the outside fogs up our minds and, and, and keeps us from being the best us that we can be. So I really appreciate that. Thank you for that. Uh, the other thing is we know that we do this work on the shoulders of all those that came before us, all those that sacrifice, all those that put in the work, all those that bled for us to be where we are right now. So with that, I'm going to ask Brother Miley to bring the ancestors into this space so that we can have their spirit and their angels watching over us. So Brother Miley. Yeah, so we, we will um, just think about for a moment those ancestors who uh, came in ancient times that built civilizations that uh, knew the way that built in Kemet, in Nubia, in Ghana, in Mali, in Songhai. And we just want to honor those ancestors by saying Ashe. Ashe. Just think of those ancestors who were brought from the mother fatherland into the Western Hemisphere. And when they got here, they continued to build and rebuild African civilizations. They didn't try to imitate other folk. They built independent African civilizations, like in Brazil, in Jamaica, in Haiti, in all of the places where we found ourselves, in the swamps of Florida with the Seminoles, we want to lift those resistant ancestors up who were resistant, resilient, and continue to fight for liberation. And they were clear about where their struggle was. We want to lift them up, Ashe. Ashe. Then here in um, these yet to be United States where we have had our battles, we think of the Fannie Lou Hamers, the Harriet Tubmans, the Denmark Vesey's, the Nat Turner's, the Gabrielle Prosser's, uh, the Kwame Ture's, um, all those who would dare struggle, dare to win. We think of them, we think of Baba Hannibal Afrique, Asa Hilliard, um, and so many, Conrad Worrell, Anderson Thompson, Sharcy McIntyre. We think of all of those brilliant, Gwendolyn Brooks, all of those brilliant ancestors who came uh, this way and sacrificed and gave and believed. We lift them up. Ashe. Ashe. And then finally, we just lift those whose names we don't know, who may have been on their way somewhere and got snatched up. And their parents and their grandparents always wonder what happened to my child 
what happened to my auntie, what happened to my uncle. And so those unnamed ancestors who um, we know they were loved the way we love ours right now. And we want to just acknowledge them, Ashe. 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 And finally, finally to those yet unborn, someday they'll come and they'll, they'll call our names if we've done our work. And they'll remember that they were yet courageous men and women in 2021 who said that they would not surrender. They would not go quietly into the night. They would continue to organize and build and inspire and love on um, Black people and create a new world. And so for those children that the beautiful ones not yet born that we make this way for, we acknowledge them by saying Ashe. 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 All right. Thank you so much, Brother Maui. Um, you know, it's so important that we acknowledge from whence we came and, and understand that there is greatness in all of us. And that greatness is what's going to get us to the future that we should be in. So thank you for that. Without further ado, I want to introduce our panelists and get into the conversation. So first, I'm going to have you guys just introduce yourselves, give a little history about your background, your work, and then we'll get into some questions and, and, and have a conversation around our topic tonight. So first up, um, I'm going to have my brother, Brother Kene Walker. Walk, can you come on and give a quick intro of yourself? I know you can give a long one because I've heard you, but I want you to give it was one of your quick ones, brother. <laughs> You're muted. You're muted. Okay, um, Martin. There can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hey, first of all, let me say good evening to all these um distinguished gentlemen on the call. I make this because I do get paid to do this stuff right here. I make this a um 15 second introduction of myself starting right now. My name is Keenan Walker, the realest motivator and eternal educator. I love black people more than I love oxygen. And I'm just honored to be in the same space with you guys who have a genuine concern about what's going on in our community. Look forward to the conversation, man. I hope I did your way up, Molly. That's um on Marty. That's 15 seconds on the dot. That might that might be a little too quick for you, brother. I, hey, I mean, I'm not used to that. You, 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 right. I know you get paid for your work, brother, but but come on, man. Tell tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Look. Okay, man. So um, one of the things that I do, I'm a founding member of Let Us Make Man, um, which is an organization that does so much work in the community behind the scenes that people would never even have an idea about other than the um, big conference that we do, our annual conference every year. I'm the founder of Brothers Building Up Brothers, which is an organization that is directly linked to what's going on on tonight's conversation because one of my former um, little brothers in my organization is a senior in college right now. He was just shot six times, man. And like it, they didn't even expect him to make it. So this is right here in the city. And he is like the most um, generous, considerate, most respectful young man that I've ever worked with in my 25 years of doing this work on behalf of the ancestors in our community. So I'm looking forward to jumping in here because this conversation is so personal for me tonight that it was almost like the universe was just working for me to even be invited in this space with everything I've been dealing with, as well as I lost a student who got hit on uh, I-85 about two weeks ago, another one of my students from a few years back. So this is Marty in closing. I think I've lost five students who I directly taught um, since last uh, 2020 up to um, recently, mm. five students. Mm. Yeah, and, and the universe is speaking to you, brother. We, we, we need your voice here tonight. Um, and likewise, um, I, I think having these kind of conversations are also cathartic for folks like you that are doing the work out in these streets. You know, you need to be able to talk about it. So we're blessed to have you here. Thank you. Sorry about, you know, the losses as well as, um, you know, the struggles that some of your obviously good young, young kings are having out there, man. So uh, we'll keep pushing and we'll talk more about it. So thank you for being here again. again more. Thank you. Um, Next up, I'm gonna bring on my brothers from uh, Chicago, um, and they're literally brothers. But I've known these guys since grammar school. Uh, we all went to the same grammar school together, St. Albies in, in Chicago, and I know that they're doing some really good work on the streets in Chicago. So I want to bring them up. First up, Carlos, can you come on? How you guys doing tonight? Good, good. brother. 
My name is um Carlos West. I'm born and raised from in Chicago. I'm a member of Phi Beta Sigma, and I'm the founder of um one founder one team one plan one brand. I'm also a former educator. I taught Chicago public schools for eleven years. I was a social center director. And I also was a basketball coach. And currently, I'm a youth advocate for um, basically for um, youth that are at risk. Awesome. Thanks so much, Carlos. Appreciate having you here. And I know that you have a lot in your background that you can share tonight. And, um, and Carlos plays Southeast Little League. He got some affiliation with Southeast Little League, doesn't yeah. he? Yes, sir. Is yes, sir. Is that male? That's yeah, man. Good. What's up, boy? How you doing, brother? I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm good. I saw one of your videos in the Southeast Little League Facebook page. I was like, man, brother's doing the work. It's good Thank to see you, fam. Good to see you, too. No doubt. Yeah, that's 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 Maoli Mel Davis, right? <laughs> you, you, know, you know the Mel Davis, right? You know, you right. Know. You you got confused. I should have told you that early on when we were talking. <laughs> I should have told you that. I it's forgot all that. love. It's shame on me for forgetting the Southeast connection because we all got that too. So, um, your brother Cartel, how you doing, man? What's going on, fellas? I'm always good, man. How y'all doing? Good, good. Mm. good. So tell us about right. your work. All right. So I'm also a member of One Team One Plan One Brand. That's uh, I'm the president of One Team One Plan One Brand, the organization that my brother started. Uh, we're a not-for-profit trying to basically make this change here in Chicago that's badly needed. Uh, went to Gramlin, lived in. Um, after Gramlin, I ran my dad's company for about six, about eight years. When after after that, I moved to Brazil. Uh, lived down there for 16 years. So I'm currently fluent in Portuguese, Spanish, uh, and I'm learning Haitian Creole. So we'll get to like the language aspect of all of this like during this conversation because I truly believe that the brothers we really really need to get into learning different languages. I explain to that you know why whatever after right now, but that's a little bit of me. Good stuff, man. Good to see you, and glad you're here, bro. And I'm glad to hear about your different experiences. You said 16 years in Brazil. 16, man. 2000 Ooh. to 2016. Wow. That's amazing, man. That's amazing. To live in another yeah. country that long that's that that should give you some interesting perspective for sure oh my god yeah and especially i was listening to brother mel uh talk about the african connection to brazil and a lot of people don't know that yeah. you know what i mean we're yeah. talking about you know, it like but brazil yeah. had more slaves than you know we did here in the states as a matter of fact 48 percent of the slaves that uh were traded within the slave market went to brazil before they even came up the coast a lot of mm. people don't know that. So ten, I think it was like 10 million of the slaves were uh, Brazilian slaves. I think here in the U.S. we had something like 300, uh, 360,000. So look at that comparison. Mm. Interesting. Good stuff. And we'll definitely delve deeper into that. Yeah. Last but not least, I wanted to bring on Baba Mustafa. Baba, we saved the saved you for last week. <laughs> hey, uh, man. Uh, hey, man, look. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Honored to be here. But look, Mahuli, just to hear you say y'all about to take this thing live again, man, I, I'm about to bring a whole bunch of brothers over there to you. Wonderful. Again, I'm Brother Mustafa. Uh, man, where do I start uh, at the beginning? Um, well, right, my claim to fame, I would say, is what's most precious to me, the fact I've been married 40 years got chosen by the most beautiful queen and, uh, you know, got, got three children, three daughters, was it three daughters, I'm losing count, three daughters and a son, two grandchildren. Those are the things that matter most to me, of course. Um, I'm working right now. I'm serving right now, actually at the Fulton County Juvenile Justice Center. So I get to see a lot of the ugly side of what's going on with this topic we're going to talk about tonight. Um, but I also, get to do some great things. We are, I would say we're very innovative at the juvenile court. I'm actually the founder of a program called the Smart Moves Young Men's Chess Club. When we do that, we're really gonna crank that up when this COVID thing dies down. 
I also do a program, I'm founding a program called Fishing with a Mission to Save Our Sons. And Brother Mawudi, I got to get with you on that so we can do some fishing trips for fathers and sons. I think probably one of the best things we can do is just stay connected. Yeah. Somebody said, a wise man said, children have to know that you care before they care to hear what you know. So we mm. got to build those relationships. Another thing that's really important, I think, and it's probably one of the most difficult things is building a bridge between the law enforcement community and, and the brothers in the community. Community policing was a big thing at one time. I don't know what happened. Maybe somebody can elaborate, but to me, I think that's a very important part of the work we're doing. If you know a child's name, first name, you're less likely to do harm to him or her. And uh, so I think that's going to be a big part of what we can do moving forward. Man. That's Bob, cool. Go ahead, Mom. Brother Mustafa, we appreciate you, man. Um, and, and he, like Kine, uh, understated their work. This brother has been consistent. When you go into the juvenile court system, I'll just tell you all from my experience in practicing law in Atlanta and around the state of Georgia, when you walk into certain places, man, there's, there's a darkness, a, a dimness, a kind of despair, right? Particularly in juvenile courts, because things are all, there's just chaos generally yeah. because, you know, it's either a child about to be taken away from their parents or the parents have done some, it's just, but I'll say this, and I say this without any reservation, uh, Brother Mustafa, um, Brother Tony, who's, who's now back in Chicago, yeah. yep. from Chicago, they were these bright lights of hope. When I walked into the space, I could just feel it. I'm like, oh, this they different. They weren't there just trying to earn a paycheck and hold this thing down. They were like, we're going to bring the light. We're going to try to change and transform some of these young brothers while we got their attention. So I just wanted to, to make sure folks understood how, because sometimes people think because you're part of the system, so-called, that right. you're part of the problem, but you can be in the system and you, you trying to pull it apart and make it do right by your people. And that's the same thing with Brother Walker. I've been in that brother's classroom. I've seen how he loves on his students, encourages his students. So this is um, a panel about, about how we love. Um, and I just want to first make sure everybody's clear. We were intentional about not using the phrase black on black crime. That's, that's a, 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 you know, a sucker move. This is community violence. Um, all communities have violence. Some communities have had more violence than others. Typically, the people that you perpetrate violence against are the people that look like you look like because you. you live in right. segregated communities in these yet to be United States. So we don't do black on black. We talk about community violence, the causes of it, and the work that, that y'all are doing to address it. So in that vein, I just want to start um, with Brother Cartel. In Chicago, we've heard and we see, and I was just, just home the last two weekends, you know, I think there were 94 shootings, 16 deaths in a three-day period, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's all over the headlines all around the country. Um, in your opinion, if Lightfoot, the mayor of Chicago, came to you and said, I'll give you any and all the resources you need to fix this situation, um, Brother West, and I'm, I'm asking everybody this, if, if Mayor Lance Bottoms uh, in Atlanta said, I'll give you all the resources you need to fix this. In, in two and a half minutes, tell me what those resources would be that you would first ask for to quote unquote, fix this situation of community violence for us. So brother, brother Cartel, I'll start with you and then we'll come to, to Brother Walker, Baba Mustafa, and then we'll close it out with Brother Carlos. 
You know what? You actually asked the question that a lot of people try to find for, find solutions. I actually, my brother actually has a good friend of his that has a company that's called Obama um, Obama Energy. Uh, that they do this thing called telelights or telestreets. Uh, I actually wasn't even gonna mention that in this conversation, but I don't know if you guys can see this right here. Can you guys see this? Yeah. This is an entire light system. You know how like um, street lights, you had a street light pose or whatever? Yeah. Well, this is all digital, so it's all connected to Wi-Fi. You have to basically make the entire community basically Wi-Fi compatible. Um, you would, it so it's cameras all over the place. A lot of people look at like cameras as being like Big Brother, but Big Brother, in my opinion, is already here. Any type of smart device, Big Brother is already here. Anybody that talks about, well, you talking about locking up brothers, the people that's worried about being uh, that being watched about cameras, those are the people that actually are doing the crime. Because me personally, I'm not doing anything wrong, so I don't care about you know, being watched. You know what I mean? This is actually a real solution. We went to a meeting about a week ago with this brother and this technology, he's the only company that actually has distribution uh, rights to this, um, to this uh, equipment. And it's really, really deep. If I had, let's say a budget of a million to put, I would put it in the poorest area in Chicago being West Pulliam or let's say I would probably, since I live on the South side, I would probably be a little bit more uh, biased and maybe put it in either in South Shore or Roseland because it's kind of close to where I live. Um, but that would be a solution. I'm tired of hearing people talk about, oh, let's have a forum to talk about how we're going to handle that. We need solutions to the mm -hmm. problem. The organization that my brother started, One Team, One Plan, One Brand, is an actual solution. Um, to the problem because we're actually giving kids uh, uh, skills that they're going to be able to use. We're starting them at say first, second grade. So we're going to be giving them skills where as they get older, they're not going to become people in the system. The 15, 16, 17 year olds that's doing, going out here doing this mess, my opinion, they're already lost. They've already committed all of these crimes. You know, you see it on TV, like Biden came here to Chicago yesterday, the day before, uh, because a white guy got shot, a white University of Chicago student got hit by um, a stray bullet on the, on the red line, got killed. So that's why Biden uh, came to Chicago. So, of course, now it's really becoming national news because of that student. So if you ask me that, that's at least a solution. I'm tired of hearing, oh, well, let's talk about what needs to be done. I want to see solutions. So that would be one solution. Our company or I'll say our, our non-for-profit, in my opinion, is another solution. Appreciate you, brother. Appreciate you. Uh, Walt, mm -hmm. Walt, jump in there, man. Okay, Molly. Um, Molly, could you rephrase that right quick? I just want to oh. make sure I'm answering. Yeah, and we can't see you, Walt. If you can come on, put your video on. Um, what I'm asking is if, if Mayor Lance Bottoms said, walk 100, you've got any and all the resources that you need, what would be some of the resources that you would ask for that you feel like can make a difference immediately? So I love what Brother West was saying. It's about solutions. You know, yeah. we're not going to call another meeting. We just saying, give me give me these resources and, and we can put this stuff to work. What 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 are your thoughts on that, bro Walt? Okay, Molly. Well, first of all, let me just start out by saying we would have to get real. You said Walt 100. That's what my kids call me, Walt 100. So when I hit that building, they already know he's gonna be 100. He coming out the hole. He go from zero to 100 real quick. So all that street stuff right there, I tell people all the time, man, the first solution is, and I heard Baba Mustafa mention it when he started his piece, Baba Mustafa, I know I use this quote a lot, children don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yes, sir. So I don't care if they're game banging in Chicago, if they're game banging in Little Rock, Arkansas, or if they're game banging in my little small hometown, Thomas and George, because I know those cats who keep them ice picks on them, who know how to poke you out. I don't care what city you're from. You can be from Chicago, but y'all get a little bit more media for it. But man, on a per capita, man, there's so much danger in the country, man, that you'll be shocked. And it doesn't even make the news. That's the scary part about it. They're not doing it because they're going to get some rank. They're doing it because this is just like, 
this constant conditioning that we've been given for centuries that nobody wants to address. So what would I do after I did that brief introduction? The first thing, Myla, I would say is that we have to awaken their genius. We have to trust their genius. And then, Myla, more so than anything, we have to teach them to execute their genius. And how do we do that? That's a program I'm working on right now called Eight. Awaken their genius, trust their genius, and execute their genius. How do we do that? Let's start with um, black boys. The question is all buried in black boys. And I'm saying this is no slight to the queens out there because the queens have the key to the whole equation. I told my girls one time, we start with black boys, it would take two weeks for us to end sagging at any inner city school if the girls just simply said, I don't date anybody who sag because my father Thank would you. not even let you step up on my porch looking Thank like that right there That's because right. you'll be disrespected not only me, but you'll be disrespected. My dad is queen who I know he, what he's going to do to you about me. But he damn sure going to do something to you about disrespecting his queen and his household. So it starts with that piece right there, Molly, black boys. And when we do that, I guarantee you we can have girls who will make boys pull their pants up just by not talking to them. So what is the key to it all, Molly? If we're going to start with black boys, though, we can preach, preach, preach. Man, this literacy piece. Man, mm -hmm. let's get rid of the milestones and all this stuff for about five years. Let's go back and do A makes a short sound and makes a long sound. Eh, eh, eh. Buh, buh, buh. See, Negroes are out here now thinking that they're going to make it in this world because of some of this quick licking they're doing. And Mala always says when his presentation that you hit that lick, dog, you got 10 fingers in the air, right? You're doing a mandatory minimum of 10. See, if I'm not literate, I don't want to be sitting in the classroom. It's not that my educators are not giving me information that's useful, but all they're doing is pumping in content knowledge. And I tell my students oftentimes, Molly, and I'll move on to my second point, content knowledge is useless, man, because the great aim of education is not knowledge, but action. So let's get busy teaching our boys how to read and understand what they're reading. That's the literacy piece I'm talking about, so they can move on to the second part, which is cultural awareness. And I have one minute left. With this cultural awareness piece, it goes to, if I don't know who I am, and I'll briefly just hold this up, something that I'm bringing back out, Molly, called the Ten Commandments of Black History. Mm -hmm. And I'll show that later on because I want to change that to the Ten Commandments of Black Our Story. And right there, when you understand that you are a god, when you understand that your mama is royalty, you understand now that I will not treat another queen any different than I treat my mom because I am aware as a god, my queen walks beside me, not behind me, because that's what our ancestors taught. And you will never get those nuggets in a school system. Hence, there's a difference between schooling and education. They're schooling you to be employees, and they're educating their children to be the employer who hires you for these 5 and $10 jobs. My last point, Milo, with my last 30 seconds, we're going to tie that all into a perfect little knot with entrepreneurship. I work behind the scenes, man, with the stuff Atlanta was doing about getting the water boys off the um, corners or whatnot. Hey, man, we're not going to let y'all do, like Molly said, this black on black one or two set incidents. And you say that's why these young brothers should be on the block selling water. I know there are other options they could have. Selling pills. They could be selling crack. They could be out here selling stolen guns. They could be doing kick doors and so on and so forth. So those water bars, whether y'all know it or not, in the city of Atlanta, those bars have created over a million-dollar market without any proper education. So I would say, Milo, we want to get real about this. Let's not play no stuff about we're doing an entrepreneurship program that's going to send them back to an $8 hour job when some of them are making $300 a day selling water. So, Milo, those will be my three points, man. I would say that we got to work on literacy and get that whole mindset of black boys changed. We got to do cultural awareness and last and certainly not least, not just for the youth, but for adults as well, entrepreneurship. Right, brother. All right. You, you, you came on with it um, as expected. And this literacy piece is very, very real. Um, when you go to Fulton County Jail, which is uh, for, for Brother Wes, our, our brothers in Chicago, Fulton is the equivalent of uh, Cook County. Um, you go to that jail and on average, they read on the sixth grade reading level. Yep. Sixth grade reading level. And so the direct connection between education and incarceration is very, very clear. Um, and I would imagine those numbers are the same across the country, yeah. that if you are unable to read, then you are more likely to be incarcerated because you're done with school, as Walk said. Um, Baba, uh, you got all the resources. What's, what's, what, where, do you, where, do you go, where do you go with this? 
Man, uh, well, I think one thing I definitely would do, let's say if I had a million dollars from uh, from my mayor, I would replicate what you're doing. Uh, I think you've got a template, you got a, a model for what I think works. Um, you know, I was, when I was working, actually working at the YMCA on Camerton Road, and I was doing a uh, alternative program with young men. And uh, they would come in, and some days they'd be high, they'd be, you know, just trying to find a way to self-medicate, deal with the stress, whatever stress they're dealing with. And uh, I took them downtown to the World of Coke. And they were all, they all walked off, walked away from me. And then they came back, because I get on them every day, look, we got to get this education, man. You got to, people pay you for what you know, not what you think you know, what you know. And he, they came back to me, they walked off, and they came back to me and said, I tell you what, we'll let go of all the weed selling, all the pills, and we'll let go of every criminal thing we do if you can put us to some work that'll pay us a decent wage. And I was thumped. I, I mean, I was happy to hear it, but I didn't have an answer. So I'm saying I don't even really have an answer now specifically, but I do know what they want because they told me. If you give us an alternative, and speaking of the brothers that are selling the water, they're amazing. I work with them every day. Brilliant. And Tina can tell you more about this than me. If we do everything based on these standardized tests, you can't, that don't measure the intelligence of our boys. I actually worked at Clayton County Jail. So what you're talking about, Brother David, my Wooly, I can tell you firsthand, them some of the most brilliant brothers you ever want to see. It just made some bad choices, and some of them just got caught up. So in short, I would say the first thing we need to focus on is creating entrepreneurial opportunities and employment opportunities that make that will give them a livable wage. Some of these brothers that I took a kid home late one night after a program, and I was trying to take him home, and he stopped me. He said, let me out right here. True story, y'all. Let me out right here. I said, you got to your house? No, nah, man, I, I can't go home right now. I said, what do you mean you can't go home? It must have been 11 o'clock at night. I can't go home, man. I got to get this money, man. I said, wait a minute, brother. I got to get this money. I can't even go in the house, brother. I got to help pay some bills. I, I got to make this money. So saying all that to say, we have got to create some opportunities for our young brothers and sisters to make a livable wage, a decent wage. And that does start, as Brother, Brother Walker said, with an education, something that they can market, an entrepreneurial opportunity. You see, we haven't done it for them, so they've done it themselves, so I admire that. And every chance I get, if, I, if it's my last dollar, I'm gonna toss it to that brother that's out there trying to hustle. So, yeah, I don't have the answer, but I'm, I'm willing to volunteer my energy and effort to anybody that does. But I think it starts with making sure these brothers and sisters can make a decent wage. It, it, you know, Baba, it, thank you for that, first of all. But secondly, um, you're speaking to, you know, kind of what we've seen in, in our universe of the Black Man Lab is to be successful, right? And that I think that our young folks, that when they have the understanding of what they are, you know, in terms of their intelligence, where they come from. Um, and when I say where they come from, I'm talking about us as black people historically. And, I, and I've said this in the, this form, form a thousand and one times. When you look at the level of oppression that we have dealt with over, you know, umpteen years, and yet here we are. Here we are. The simple fact that we are here tells you the resilience, the innovation, the create creativity that we have as black folks to survive. That doesn't that doesn't happen because you're dumb, you know. Right. That doesn't happen because you you don't have the same level of intelligence as other folks out there. It happens because yours is better. They couldn't do what we do, right? And those young folks need to have that level of understanding, especially our young brothers. Um, so I appreciate your insight into that, and that 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 is um, that speaks to exactly I think what we have to figure out, and that's what this conversation is kind of about. How do we figure out to manifest that in every one of our young brothers out there? Yes, Black Man Lab is an organization that does that, 
Brother Walk is out there. Um, Brother, Brothers West are doing the work. Uh, you are. But how do we manifest that even further? And we'll get into that um, after after Brother Carlos. Carlos, are you there? Hi. Hey. So the the question to you, um, as it was to the other brothers, if you if Lori Lightfoot said, "Hey, here's whatever resources you need. Here they are." What would you do with them to to change the the paradigm of what our communities are looking looking like right now? Okay, <clears throat> the first thing I would do, <clears throat> I'm coming from the teaching perspective because I used to be a school teacher and a social center director and coach. So, the to Brother Davis's point, um, the kids are reading at a sixth grade reading level. So when I was a teacher, one of the things they complained about is they didn't see themselves in the literature. So like if kids know how to rap and know all the lyrics, it's not intelligence, it's they're bored. So I don't know if you guys could see this. So one of the books we have in the curriculum is Diary for Boys and, it, and Boys to Teens to Men. Can you guys see that? Yeah. So yeah. the author of this book is named Aaron Brown, and he's my mentor. He's a former PE teacher, and he was also in the $27 group, which was my father's golf group, like the biggest golf group in Chicago. So what he does using the book, he uses characters, and it discusses skills. So it talks about envy, jealousy, hatred, despair, peace, love, truth, equality, wisdom, etc. So he uses the characters to teach the kids why they're acting like this. And then you can see like the, the kids hat on backwards. So the kids can identify themselves in the book. This next book is called Dead End. This is by J. Anthony Gray. So basically this book talks about a dead end in the streets. If you out hustling, you either going to end up dead or in jail. <clears throat> and then this book is called Wake Up Black America. We're sleepwalking back to slavery. So we're going to use the curriculum, first of all, where the kids would see themselves in the curriculum. The second thing, if we have a bunch of money, we have programs that are already written. So we have like the three programs we starting first, our instructional, which I'm doing, and then my brother's going to do the foreign language and STEM. So I'm going to read like future programs, military leadership, communication, music, entertainment, photography, art, business, entrepreneurship job, career training, family life, barber, clothing, agriculture, culinary, parks, transportation, child care, medical, nursing, automotive, flight school, hotel, restaurant, architecture, engineering, construction, car carpentry, painting, plumbing, electrical, flooring, roofing, welding, concrete, landscaping, swimming, gymnastics, boxing, wrestling, golf, tennis, track, soccer, bowling, hockey, basketball, football, baseball. So I'm going to use the sports programs. We don't want to just teach the kids to play basketball. Basketball is a business. So the, being a referee is a job. Being a coach is a job. Being a GM is a job. An athletic trainer the media person that's going to announce it, like Stephen A. Smith. So we want to integrate this where the kids are in these programs where they could get jobs. So we had the million dollars. We have a, a facility on the south side, the west side, the south suburbs, the west su suburbs, and the kids will go to the programs that interest them. So particularly, that's why black boys have a tendency to drop out because if they're not interested. They know they're not making money. So if you can't read, they say, why am I going to waste my time going to school when I can go on the corner to hustle? 
Good stuff, brother. Man, that 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 was comprehensive as hell right there, Carlos. <laughs> you touch it on everything, brother, mm-hmm. which is great. And that's that speaks to what we try to do here at the Black Man Lab. You know, every week we have a different topic with the hopes that that topic catches somebody. You know what I mean? We want we want these young brothers. Cause I think the the other thing, and y'all might want to correct me on this if you or if you think differently. I think the other thing is our young brothers may have interest in other things, right? right? One, they may not have a good level of understanding of, of how can I get there, you know, to do that. Um, or two, they may say, well, that ain't cool, you know? So when they see a brother that, you know, is like Walt or like you, Baba, that they see out there that are doing is doing this work and they say, oh, that's a cool brother, you know? Why, I could do that. I would love to do that. You know, the problem is, is that there hasn't been enough of us that have reached out in some form or fashion. And I know there are plenty of organizations out there doing the work. Um, And I was just, I just had a conversation and I'll I'll, I'll share this with you all and then we'll move on. I just had a conversation with somebody recently from another organization that's doing really good work. And I said, man, we have to find a way that we are able to galvanize together better because the mountain of oppression that is out there is so big that we cannot continue to go picking at it with little snail forks. That's what we're doing. You know, it's this, we're all doing great work, but we're all just picking at this big mountain of oppression. So it really doesn't go anywhere. But now if we are to galvanize, and that's my next question to you all, what do you see? How do you see us being able to galvanize our resources together so that we're not waiting for Lori Lightfoot. We're not waiting for Keisha Lance Bottoms to, to get ourselves together to, to attack this better. And Bob, I'll start with you. Well, you know, the first thing that came to mind when you said that uh, is, is places like where, where you are, where the Black Man Lab meets. They got that big old gymnasium over there. Uh, and and we've talked about this. I've sat in on so many meetings for so many years. And I've been doing this work. For, I'm 64, so you can imagine, probably about 40 years. Now. Um, if we don't meet but twice a year, ideally quarterly, all of these organizations that you're speaking of that are doing great work, great work, meet and just kind of talk about the thing, the vision you have, the things you're doing in the community, and coordinate quarterly. You know, you have to map out a plan, a strategy, and and make sure that you continue this meeting because it's like we keep reinventing the wheel, starting over and over again. And I know I'm preaching to the choir. I just think that if we simply make this a ritual, then our young people see these habits and see these rituals and they chime in. Uh, yeah, I just think I think we need to take advantage of the fact that we do have so many people doing good work, but we don't coordinate enough. That's not to knock what we're doing. I'm just saying, that, as you said, to make it better, to make it more effective, if we would just meet more consistently and strategize more regularly, then we'd be far more effective than we are. Absolutely. I, I 100% agree with that. Um, because I, I'm always amazed that ever since we've been doing this in this forum, I've had more and more people reach out to me to say, hey, we want to work with Black Man Lab, or or they may want to work with another organization that was on here. Can you connect me, so on and so forth. And as, the, as I spin my wheels on that, or if I make the connection, or if I say, okay, yeah, we meet every Monday, I'm still in the position where, um, and we're still in the position where, um, we're just kind of spinning our wheels, right? We're doing the same thing, getting getting the same results. But I, I think now more than ever, we have some really, as I, especially as I listen to you guys, we have some really strong brothers that all are on the same page of dealing with oppression as we see it in our communities, right? Because we know that this, what the condition of our com- communities is, isn't because of who we are. It's because of what we've been through. Right as 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 a as a, uh, as a people. So, um, what what about you, Walk? Do you think that think of what do you think about that? 
I love, first of all, Marty, let me thank you for the way you framed that question or whatnot. Um, mountain of oppression. Man, mm -hmm. you can't even start without talking about, you know, folks say, man, don't make a mountain out of a mole here. Well, hell, what do you make out of a mountain? You know what I'm saying? I right, mean, right, so we ain't right. talking about no mold here. Let's get real, man. So uh, yeah. I'm sitting here, I'm taking notes, copious notes, as Bible was talking about consistency, organizing, rituals, and habit. One of the things that um perplexes me more than anything, man, is this whole idea that black folks got tier one HBCUs and tier two HBCUs and all these little mind games we allow people to play with our community to say that if you go to this university right here, this is the top level black school right here. So kids even graduate and where that used to be something to be proud of now you know you graduated and you feel bad because you didn't get into one of the big three you know what i mean so like bro when you start talking about how do we uh organize and galvanize our resources and i'm gonna say this and that might be some folks who get mad and i'm gonna say this right here though brother yeah. why the hell is it that y'all give all y'all money to three black colleges <laughs> galvanize let's damn dig deep and see which the mars brown is the blackest college on that doggone au center and y'all let that school close down and that's a black campus right there talking about galvanizing these you have a song in atlanta like money ain't a thing but damn it money thing then won't you throw some of that money then at these eight we got people who are doing the work out here we're not even asking you to do the work man sometimes all of the soldiers don't have to be a soldier who's on the front line we can learn that lesson from my brother ag gaston down in birmingham alabama who they will never teach about in the standards in u.s history or government but you don't have a dr king and all of those protesters getting out of jail in birmingham on the bull corner without ag gaston having the money to get them out of jail why don't we know about that, brother? And that ties into what my brother was saying earlier when he talked about those life skills or whatnot. What about that brother right there? Hey, man, I might not have a college degree, but, bro, one thing you don't have to worry about at the hotel, Mr. Gaston, since you provide a housing for the people when they come to town because we're talking about segregated Birmingham. You know what we're talking about right now? Uh-oh, we lost, we lost brother Walk, man. When he gets I mean, there was up, a, a, a passion... <laughs> Level. That wasn't, <laughs> right. Zoom, that's Zoom right. couldn't take his passion, dog. We lost hey, you. That's my, that's my dude right there, man. Yes, all, all facts. What he's saying, man. I hope he gets back in here quick. Yeah, he'll be back. Absolutely. He'll, he he gonna come back. You know why? No uh, lies, but, man. While we got this little break, though, let me bring in my brother OG, who's who's joined us, man, from Chicago. I'm um, glad you were able to join us, brother OG. Come on in and introduce yourself, man. Yeah, first of all, thank you for having me. I jumped on at a perfect moment. I felt the passion that my brother was putting out there. Uh, but once again, O.G. Eggleston, born and raised in the city of Chicago, um, currently uh, executive director for Chicago Survivors. Uh, we provide resources for family members that lose a loved one to homicide in the city of Chicago. So anybody that's following any type of news anybody that's in the city of chicago you know that this unfortunately is a very busy time for us um mm -hmm. so just brief introduction happy to be here looking forward to learning from the conversation and providing input where i can man appreciate you bro and good to see you and um you know that that work that you're doing gotta be taxing on you and the people that work along you alongside of you man because there is so much going on back home right now, man. And, and, uh, but we need people like you to be doing that work to keep people strong, mm -hmm. keep us moving yep. forward. Thank you for that. But we'll bring you back into the conversation as well. Brother, yep. brother Walker, you, 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 we said that you got so fired up, man, that you made your zoom fail, brother. Put your <laughs> mic back on. Get your mic back on, bro. There you go. Can't do, man. I was fired up, brother, and I'm still fired up. And I get I get a chance to give this to those um those scholars every single day, man, at the South Atlanta University. And I tell people, you know, I tell my students oftentimes, you guys, when we start talking about galvanizing, now I bring this to my organization that I um collaborated and co-founded with brother Miley Davis and another a, no, a host of other great brothers. But one of the things I tell my scholars, man, every single day that you guys are fortunate, man, to be at South Atlanta High School with some of the best educators, man, in the whole country. And you don't realize it right now while you're here because you're looking over across I-20 at North Atlanta High School because everything look bigger, brighter, shinier. I said, man, y'all got some personal relationship with educators like myself. And I don't allow them, Marty, 
to call me a teacher. I tell them teachers pump in content knowledge, educators pull out greatness. So when we start mm -hmm. galvanizing, we're going to get some of these brilliant minds. And let me just clear something up. It was no attack on the big three. I just need you to see, sometimes we got to have some tough conversation when we start talking about galvanizing. You know, it's kind of like if you grow up on a certain side of Chicago where you're more affluent, and all of a sudden, Negro said, bro, you pay, played in the Southeast Baseball League with us, and now you can't even come back and buy some uniform for a team, and you're on, 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 on national TV giving money to other communities. You do what you want to with your money. However, if we're going to galvanize, we got to quit asking for crumbs from the government. We got to do what Big Mama them did when they didn't even have formal education back in the day. But how the hell that my grandma, who didn't even make it to high school, own two businesses, but I got family members who got two and three doctorate degrees and don't have a damn job. So my wow. thing is, when we start talking about galvanizing, I bring this to a, it goes back to literacy. This is a book that I collaborated with called Masterminds of Mentoring and Human, Masterminds and Human Motivation. And if you look at the back cover, man, there are a bunch of scholars on this book who decided that we need to galvanize. I cannot stay in my own little cocoon and have all of my wisdom and all of my degrees and all of my knowledge and don't share it with the very brothers who I get a chance to stand on the stage and get paid thousands of dollars speaking to their problems. But I have no solutions to offer back to those brothers because I keep it all to myself in my own little select group. So when we start thinking about galvanizing, we got to understand, like somebody said earlier, what I think Mustafa said that, what do the young brothers need? This book right here, man, is called The Hip Hop Generation, Bukhari Kawana. And it was called that in the subtitle, Young Blacks and the Crisis in African American Culture. If you're going to work with our young babies and we're going to galvanize because it starts with the bottom, y'all already know that. You know what I'm saying? If you ask some people in East Africa, I can't even say the tribe right now. I thought they called the Maasai or something along those lines. It just said, if you want to know what the community looked like, it asked them, it just said, they asked the question. I'm talking about warriors would ask each other this question. How are the children? Are if the children? children are well, the community is well. If the right. children are screwed up, that means we failed them because we as grown folk cannot galvanize and show them that people who look like them, we have always done for ourselves. We allow somebody to school us to think that we are welfare recipients. That's not who we are. That goes back to the cultural awareness. And lastly, I got this new book, man, I picked up. It's a new one, um, Dante Lee called Black Business Secrets, 500 Tips, Strategies, and Resources for the African-American Entrepreneur. Can you imagine if all of the black entrepreneurs in Atlanta galvanized, all of us decided that we're going to share our resources. We're not even going to take away from your regular everyday avocation, how you make your millions or whatnot. Hey, man, all we want is one tip from all of the entrepreneurs. We're going to get with all of the water boys on the block. We're going to start with those black boys again. We're going to galvanize those young men to create their own entrepreneurship incubator. And I mm. already have a model for it right now called the Awaken the Genius Entrepreneurship Institute. I would love to get with those brothers from Chicago because I know we have a Phi Beta Sigma brother on here. I know he probably see that black and old gold right here, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. We got to galvanize this energy together. And lastly, his brother, who's at Gremlin State University, I'm Alabama State University all day, every day, man. So y'all know it's a swag thing. But if we want to do it, man, I think it takes something like what we do um, with Let Us Make Man, bro. And I will drop the mic right here. And Let Us Make Man, everybody has to check their degrees at the door. Everybody check their college at the door. Everybody check their um, income at the door because if you don't love black people, that's the only thing that we're here for. We're solution driven, we're community driven. And when you start talking about how do we galvanize, when all of us come into that room, the only thing that matters is it's a bunch of men who have one vision, but we're doing it collectively. So y'all, it starts with us, first and foremost, the black men, getting some humility. It starts with us asking the question to each other as black kings and black men, how are the children? And lastly, we got to give them some solutions, man, like going out there to create their own doggone markets and whatnot and quit depending on the government who doesn't give a dang about your community, man. So that's what I have to offer to that thing about galvanizing and um, putting our resources together. Hey, let, me, let me say this, man. Let me say this. You know, Walt, Walt I know Walt for a little bit, and that you're amazing, brother. And everything you said, everybody's on here nodding their heads, man, because you're right. And the thing about Walt, man, that dude – Practice what he preached. When I'm in there on a Saturday mornings with Next Level, I see Walt. When I go to a Next Level, when I go to a long banquet, I see Walt. When I'm in the schools trying to work with students, I see Walt. I mean, dude is like walking that walk. Man, you all are, man. 
but I, I want to just emphasize something he said because uh, Baba said it and, and Walt, you said it, and we say it in so many different ways, but one of the things I always express to, to my mentees and, and, and the mentors that work with them, these young brothers can't be what they don't see. And mm -hmm. so if they don't see us, if they don't see this right here, what we doing, if they don't see grown men that can disagree and still go out and grab a brew together or hang out together, they don't know how to do it. And so we joke about it, but Walt's right. One thing I learned quickly when I got out of school, man, is, yeah, you know, when we was at, at, at school, we was, I was an alpha and we was going to fight the noobs and fight the cues, da 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 woo woo. Man, when I got out of corporate America with all these white folks, I was glad to see a cat. <laughs> Glad to see a signal because I knew yeah. that was a similar path. Yes, that galvanizing thing is real, man. But we we might jest and joke about things, but these young brothers don't see that I'm working with a new every Monday night on, on Black Man Lab. That I'm mm -hmm. working with a new every Saturday at Next Level. I, don't, I, don't, I mean, Walt, you one of the few brothers that I'm in space with when it comes to this, but for me. I'm going to be around those brothers that are building up these young men. Whether you Greek, not. Whether you from FAMU, Howard, uh, uh, Smith, Lincoln, it don't matter. Like, I want you all to understand that this is the village. And that's galvanizing. And everything you said, brother, is when we start taking these labels off. They want to put them to HBCU, bro. You know how many HBCUs there are out there? And we talking about, you say three, we might talk about five. We might talk about seven. But, bro, it's so many more that we need to be supporting. So, Walt, man, thank you for, for that passion. Thank you for that real. And, Baba, for leading us into that conversation, man, because I'm telling you, in my 50s, and I see all the things that, that we don't galvanize because we're so individualized trying to do things, and that's why it's so important for us to be in this space. I appreciate y'all saying those things, man, for real. Well, well to your point, Joe, um, and I think everybody on the panel will agree with this. We're first of all, we're already at seven after seven thirty. So wow. good, these good conversations go like this, right? We're supposed Man. to end at seven forty-five. We may take it a few minutes longer tonight because we're really delving into some good stuff. But um, to your point, I think that um, when it comes when we talk about galvanizing, the challenge has been that we have been conditioned to operate within an ideology that is not ours, right? Um, our, our African ideology tells us we should be about community, the earth and love, right? That's, that's the baseline of what every African culture has, has had. Um, and yet we, we start operating outside of that. And when you talk about egos, um, that's also somebody else's ideology that we try to that we operate within and because of that um our individual organizations do the same thing you know or we we well my organization's better than your organization right. is, is all these organizations are great if they're doing the right work and the reality of it is we all are trying to do the same thing but we allow sometimes um these different ideologies to get in the way of us doing the right work um, but I think today, I think that that where we're at today um, as a community, um, one, because of what our, our our communities are going through in terms of the levels of violence and people looking for solutions, likewise, the visibility of it. Um, when I say that, I mean, meaning, you know, there was a time when George Floyd would have happened and nobody would have knew, you know. Now these things are being videoed. So people are, their level of, rate of, of awareness has been raised. So um, it, as unfortunate as it is, I think it's also good in bringing us closer to a level of being galvanized. Um, because once that happens, we, it's going to be dangerous for, for those that don't want us to be. Baba, you're going to say something? Yeah, just something as you think I'm listening to you and I'm thinking about something that's just real, real to me. Mm -hmm. um, most of the young young brothers, and we we focusing on young brothers. Most of the young brothers I work with at the juvenile court have one thing in common. Most of them being raised by a single mother. I mean, we literally celebrate when a black man walks into the courtroom with his son or his daughter, 
and says, I'm here to support my child. If there's one thing that I think we can all do, and I think all of us, present company excluded, all of us are doing this anyway. One thing that we can do is commit to one child, one family, and say, this young man, I'm taking under my wing. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, it amazes me that a lot of the young people that I work with, the things that we consider simple, I'm in, I'm in college right now myself, and I'm telling you, it's a headache. At 64, I should know all of this stuff. Just financial aid and all that foolishness that goes along with it, and studying. And all. Now imagine this child that they're saying has a sixth grade education, which he's much brighter than that, and she's much brighter than that. And you know this. Nobody's taking that child by the hand. And it can, the key is consistency. We can start it, but you can't stop in the middle. You got to see that child all the way through. What I'm getting at is if, if, if we can get more brothers, again, present companies, excluded, y'all do it. I know you're doing it. Get more brothers just to commit to one child and say, this one is mine. I'll give you a perfect example. Young man, I started mentoring when he was 14, single mother raising him. Uh, and she was dealing with her own issues. Uh, may have been drugs. I don't, I don't know specifically what it was. But she was very angry. And she would put him out one week and he'd have to come stay with me and he'd be in the street and he lived most of his life. I didn't notice until he was old. He lived at what's this book bookstore uh, Barnes and Noble. He would go there all day, spend his whole day reading books. Long story short, he put him out and I convinced him he was just about to hit the streets and start selling guns. And he told me about a, an adult had approached him and said, man, I can get put some money in your pocket. You just do this for me. And he came to me. Thank God he came to me because he had that relationship that I'm talking about. He came to me and said, Mr. Mustafa, I don't want to do this. But can you? I said, look, brother, you talked about going in the Navy. I'm going to help you. If that's what you want to do. That brother took that ass back and tested off the charts because he'd been reading. He'd been educating himself. My wife used to take him to Clark College when she was in college. And he would sit in the classroom when nobody else would raise their hand. He would answer the question. This is a 15, 16-year-old kid. And, they, and there are so many of them mm -hmm. that we don't even know. Keen does. Maybe, maybe more of us than I know. But um, what I'm getting at is the young man right now has been in the Navy and traveled all over the world. Now, this kid was homeless at 15. Didn't know, about to start selling guns. He has now been in the Navy for about 15 years. He calls me up every now and then and says, man, I'm in Japan. I'm in what? And I'm just sitting there in amazement. I'm in Hawaii. You want me to ship you and your wife out? I said, no, brother. <laughs> Thank you, but keep your money and take care because he just had a beautiful baby. Just got married. I'm so proud of him. I'm telling that story to say that's all it takes, that connection. If each one, each one, teach one, each one, reach one, if we commit to just do that, we'll change the world. One child at a time. Every, every organization, and I'm one more thing, and I'm going to shut up. We need to celebrate these brothers. I went to a, a thing called Salute the Black Father. It must have been 15 years ago. I ain't seen one since. Maybe I don't know about it. Maybe I don't know about it. You want to accentuate what you want to see more of. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? If we start to celebrate, then the young brothers that show up, oh man, that's brother Sonson, that's brother King, that's brother Marty, that's brother Joe, brother Carlos, they're celebrating him. I'd like to be celebrated, you know, not egotistically, but it's just nice to somebody say, man, or thank you. Affirmation. We need to do that at least once a year, twice a year, celebrate the things that we want to see more of. Yeah. And you'll see more brothers starting to come out and say, man, this, that's nice. Just the fellowship. The yeah. fellowship at the, at the uh, uh, why do I forget the name of it? Black Man Lab. Black, Black Man Lab, but not on the King. The thing we do every year, Let Us Make Man. Yeah, that man. fellowship, I hadn't, made it, I hadn't made it, and I need to get there more often, but I'm always working, always, or in school. There's no excuse, though. We need to make time to celebrate these accomplishments because I'm telling you, that's how we turn this thing around is we start to celebrate, get that one child and stick with him until he gets in college 
or he goes in the military or whatever it is that he wants to do because we have to take them by the hand sometimes. It might seem like a lot, but we assume that they know they don't. They don't have anybody but mom and she got four other kids and she's trying to take care of them. And that young man, he gets, I'm telling you this other part, I'm going to shut up again. There's some gangs out here that's doing a better job than we are. And that's a problem at recruiting our young men. I'm going to leave it right there. Yeah, and you're, you're absolutely right. Um, I think that uh, as it relates to, to us reaching and touching, right, a big part of that is it's really simple. When, the, when our young folks see that there's a different way, right, when they, when they, one, when they see there's a different way, but then two, when they are actually having somebody show them the attention, that they don't normally see mm -hmm. that changes the paradigm of everything it, it to, to, to use brother walks phrase, it awakens the genius in them. It does, you know, it awake. Cause it, we know, we know that given the opportunity, our young folks, both, both male and female, our young folks, when given the opportunity and placed in the right environment that, that opens them up for, all the greatness within them, we see it time and again, whether that's in entertainment, whether that's in sports, whether that's in business, wherever, we see it time and again. The challenge is, is that our society, the society, I shouldn't say our society, the society that we're in does everything possible to mute the greatness in our people, right? Yeah. And that's because our people have, have historically been the biggest commodity to the United States. And how do you oh. Right. You remain a commodity be, by being used. That's what a commodity is. Right. So mm -hmm. that's that's been what we've been. So, of course, that would not be what they would want to see. But it's on. If us. I can add something to that, please. Also, I think that the society, it basically pits us against each other. Like my brother was talking about how, like, I'm, I'm also a Sigma. And when we were in college, you know, the, the, we didn't like this group. We didn't like that group. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So that's a societal thing. Mm -hmm. Like one thing that, that yeah. we did uh, at like our non-for-profit one team, one plan, one brand, if you look at our page, there's a part where it says uh, a call for help from the divine nine. So basically our thought is if I'm a Sigma, me and using my platform is much weaker if we were to like join forces every organization not just greek organizations but every organization I'm, i'll just read you a part of, of our website this is the divine nine section it says uh this is my my brother did a video my brother's name is carlos west look at his page his personal page he did a video but in it, it says he said that um he then said what has become our motto here at one team one plan one brand Get the hell out and get in these streets. He has, he has as of October uh, 20th, 2020, uh, 220,000 views without any type of uh, platform. He called for every organization to, uh, to own not only using their platform to make real change. Pro athletes are now using their platforms. Actors in Hollywood, excuse me, are using their platforms. We can do the same. Why not join forces to solve a problem that affects all of us in the divine nine? So that's what really it should be all, uh, should be about. I see every single organization trying to do things that everybody is doing great work. But if we get together, if, if we say, hey, look, enough, enough, and we use our platforms as one whole, as mm -hmm. one powerful people, that's what's going to change everything. That's just going to change everything. As long and, and as well as our the programs, each individual program that we have. Like I'm just going to talk about the one program. I'm in charge. My brother said of uh, our STEM program and foreign language program. And I did a lot of research as far as our the foreign language and why brothers don't um, uh, learn any type of foreign language. So I'm gonna give you a little history. Uh, I, like I said, I lived in Brazil for 16 years, so I did a little history on that. So Brazil was the last country in, on the planet that ended slavery in 1888. Uh, uh, they had what they called as a whitening policy. So 
in 19 in the 1920s a lot of uh, uh, african americans here in the us basically wanted to migrate to central and south america because we were getting lynched we were getting beaten you had jim crow and everything so we'd have had the opportunities that a lot of societies had so there was a huge migration of blacks going to central and south america so a lot of people wanted to go to brazil you know because brazil was known as a country that they had a lot of opportunity Brazil wanted to do or did what was called a whitening policy along with the U.S. government because they were tired of their country being so, it was come, becoming too colorful. You know what I mean? It was too, you know, because the Brazilians are mixed with Indians, Blacks, and whites. But because at the end of slavery, it was so many uh, slaves, basically our color is the most dominant color. So we were dominating their their culture. So they had what was called a whitening. So the United States government, along with the Brazilian government, basically stopped immigration or our migration to Brazil. So basically, that's what, that's that's history. I see anybody that wants like the history on that, I will send that to you. Send me a send me a message in the inbox. Um, so in the United States, we got twenty two percent of Africa. I'm sorry, of the United States that speak. A second language of that twenty two percent fifteen you take out because these are immigrants that basically came over to the United States from any hispanic speaking country or you know a different country around the world, so at least seven percent of that seven percent six point nine nine percent are white, so that leaves zero point zero zero one or one out of every thousand people that in in our community that actually speak a second language. I lived in Brazil for 16 years. I saw the opportunities that I had. I, I had. I worked for a company called Loja Medicana, which is the Brazilian version of Walmart. I was a translator for them for like 13 years. I did contracting work for, uh, or consulting work, I should say, for contractors that went down to the United States, um, down to Brazil from the U.S. I did contracting work for the government, you know, the, the United States government, for people that a lot of Americans, they go to especially other races, they go down to Brazil, they do messed up stuff. They have things that are called favelas, a place that calls favelas, which are like what we would consider as um, projects. But you know, there's like basically the slump. So these white people go down to these areas and just do messed up stuff. And because they have money, they will basically get, I don't know, kidnapped or, you know, whatever. So the, the white people, they basically take care of their own. So they would actually send their people in along with people that could kind of resolve the situation. So I got contracted out for a few of those jobs as well. So it's so much that you can do speaking a second language and we don't even get a piece of that pie. So, it, you know, a lot, a lot of this stuff, you don't even need a college education. I, I actually, I don't have a degree, but I was able to do, a, I was able to do all of this stuff. With, I, I went to Grambling, I never graduated. Marty, so Marty, yeah, can I say something? Yeah, absolutely. Cut your brother off. <laughs> Walt. <laughs> Walt, yo, I really, brother Walt, I love the way you were honest. The things that we gotta <clears throat> do is we gotta be, we have to hold each other accountable and we have to be honest. So, one of the problems are these fraternities and sororities. So I'm a, I'm a Sigma. So when, when you sit in chapter meeting and we have all these things going on in the communities, where are the brothers and sisters at? So for example, and I, I don't like to call names out of nothing. So let's take Kamala Harris. How can all the Greeks and AKAs come to raise all this money for her but we got kids that's starving, uneducated, but they don't have the energy to go, like the brother said, grab one kid. Yeah. So the, the women in the sororities and the men in the fraternities are to the point where they don't want to give back and go work. They want to front like they're doing what they're not doing. That's one of the, because if, if our body grabbed a kid or two, we wouldn't be in the situation we are in. Wow. That's a, so we got to be honest with ourselves because if 
that's why my thought of one team, one plan, one brand is an all-inclusive organization. So mm -hmm. it's not just Greeks. I say GDs is gang members, churches, men, women, because the basis of it is to make sure the women, children, community are safe and we get the resources we need. So the more the numbers we have and we working for the same thing, we will be able to get the resources. So we have, like the brothers said earlier, I was in college, like when I was in the college, we would get into it with cappers. So out, you know, the, so if if y'all, how can they get along? Because they don't see the the people in the streets really don't know about fraternities. They know colors. So when that, like, so when they on Facebook, if you look at the events, if it's a Kappa event. It's all capitals. If it's an alpha event, if we we are separated, so we need to start being together to show that we in this together. So then we could go to gangs, bloods, crips, GDs. Man, y'all need to get along. But they could point the fig finger at us and say y'all don't get along. Oh, when we see y'all together. That's real. Uh, yeah. That's uh. That's a great point, and, and one of which, you know, um, the, the the idea of galvanizing has been um, heavy on on us as a group in, in Black Men Lab, again, because of how um, we are contacted by so many organizations. Um, but one of the things that has always been in the back of my mind is, is just that, you know, we have all of these different organizations, be they Greek or whatever, um, that kind of operate within their own silos and, and in some cases are very competitive with one another um, for, for whatever reason. And I just, me personally, that's just not my ideology. My ideology is that, you know, we need to all be together and on the same page, at least about this one thing, right? Yeah. The one, so we, the let's, that, go ahead, let's take the, let's talk economics. The Greek organizations were founded from what 1908. We were 19 for different years, 1911. We go to all these regional conventions, national conventions, spend all this money with white people, and we have not yet had enough sense to come together to buy one hotel to have all the conventions there. I mean, that's just plain ignorance. We spending millions of dollars going to regional conventions, national conventions to talk about absolutely nothing. Then after you had a meet, it's just a party. Step shows. It's like buff buffoonery. You, but the people Carlos, in it. So Carlos, if the, that's somebody else's ideology, right? And that's what, right. that's what's happening. So, we follow somebody else's ideology and get away from who we are as African people. And that's right. why uh -huh. we can talk about it all day long in terms of what we've but, been doing, but. No, my, so my point, just think. So the powers to be, if, if we're so-called the educated people and we do things that don't make sense, this is why they look at us like they do because we have we don't have enough enough sense to come together and put everything is galvanizing means economically also putting the tools together to own stuff we own one percent of everything in america we own less now than we did for slavery that <clears throat> means all these years we have not moved anything <laughs> absolutely Absolutely. And that's so, you know, we have a, a, a central way. And, and I think that we're going to get to that. We, I, before we go any further on that, though, I want to I want to make sure that we we dial it back just a little bit because we we first of all, just so you all know, we are way over time. We're supposed to be done at 745. But this conversation has been so meaningful and needed. Um, and I think, as I said at the beginning, somewhat cathartic for all of us. Um, 
that I, I had no way wanted to stop it. Um, we would normally be well over by now, but I'm going to keep us going. Also, this is the last one of these that we're doing um, right. in terms of being virtual. So why the hell not? Let's keep it pushing, you know. So, <laughs> um, Love it. But what I wanted to do. I just had a quick, I just had a quick question because you guys are there in law. That you guys are that in law. I was I just put a question out there. Are you guys familiar with um, uh, Kareem West? He's the first African American uh, juvenile juvenile court judge down in Cobb County. Down there, oh. he was our he's our cousin. That's why I was asking. Oh, I, I'm not, but I'm gonna get to know him real yeah, soon. Yeah. I'm not familiar. I'm sure Molly. By the way, Molly had to jump off because he had a situation that. that he had to deal with. He's dealing with a. Um, uh, a domestic situation, uh, not his own, of course, but a domestic situation that he needed to do some intervention on. So he had to jump. Okay. But I guarantee you, Cartel, I'll ask him. I'm sure he knows him because uh, okay. he's well-known in the legal com com community down here. Um, yeah, well, he well, just got appointed in uh, 2018. Okay. He'll know him. Um, what I want to do is is make sure that we, we dial back to our original uh, – um, topic, which is uh, violence in the communities um, and how we're addressing it. I want to bring Brother OG in. Just to tell about your experience of, you know, you're dealing with kind of the after effects, right? And what does that look like for you? How do you address those families? What have you seen? And then likewise, we had a question earlier that you probably didn't hear, which was if Lori Lightfoot said, hey, Brother OG, here, you can have Whatever resources you need to change this change the paradigm of what looks it looks like in your communities right now, what what do you think would be um, resources that would make that happen for you? Yeah. Um, so just to uh, address the first question that you asked, um, what does it look like um, in the communities now? It's trauma. It's you know PTSD. It's lack of mental health support. Um, and this is multi-victimization, so we're dealing with families and communities that, you know, lack uh, efficient education. So that's an issue that they've been dealing with since they're four or five years old. You have lack of um, employment, so you're dealing with the trauma associated with that. You have ongoing community violence that, you know, you're dealing with living in those communities, and then it hit home where you lose a loved one. So that's just compounded trauma or complex trauma, depending on what term you want to use. Um, so for me, you know, I've been involved in community development for 20 years. I left corporate America to work in the communities. And, you know, homicides were a statistic, unfortunately. I mean, I've lost some friends here and there, but, you know, really on the news, you see the number of homicides in the weekend. You know, so it's more of a number. Um, with this job, I get notification from the Chicago Police Department every single time there's a homicide in the city. And I get a name. I get their age. I get their gender. I get the location so I know which communities are being heavily affected, which we already know, black predominantly, and then brown secondarily. And so now, not only is it a, a, a person, a name tied to this number, but then I now know that there's a family behind that homicide. So is this a sibling? Is this a, a, a parent? What have you? So it's it's a it's it's a deeper level of understanding for me now. Whereas before it was that that's a violent community or there's you know a high rate of homicides over holiday weekends. So that's one. Um, two, in terms of if Lori Lightfoot came to me and said here's a pot of money, what would you do? And it kind of really ties into some of the points that you all made talking about galvanizing. I wouldn't keep all of that money within my organization because our organization focuses on mental health. We focus on crisis response to de-escalate violence at the scene of the crime. But we don't do employment, which is key. Um, we don't provide long-term mental health. We provide you know, um, a bridge mental health support. So I would bring in other providers. 
we are citywide, but we don't have the roots in every single community that's affected, which means I need to go develop partnerships within communities that have the relationships with the families that know the communities, that know the needs of the community, et cetera. So I will use some of that money to expand our services, but I will also use parts of that money to fund organizations that are experts and specialize in specific communities that need to be impacted. So that's short, you know, of course, a short answer that that's what I would do, but it's, it's, it's the spoke in the wheel situation. There is no one area that we have to address. It has to be a multi-pronged approach, but what many people have said since I've joined the call, we have to be able to sit down at the table. Like so, I think someone said, you leave your affiliation at the door, you leave your income at the door, you leave all of the, all of our filters. Everything that they stated is basically a filter that we look through that causes us to act the way that we do. So man, leave, take your glasses off, leave them filters at the door. We come down, we have a conversation, we argue, we fight it out. But when it's all said and done, we have some direction on the board that we all agree on. We may not agree on every single thing, but when we walk out of this room, there's three things we focusing on. And we're throwing all of our resources and all our energy on these three things because we think they're the most impactful. Until we're able to do that, we're really addressing symptoms in my opinion. And so we have to dig deeper. We have to really get to the root cause of what's happening in our communities. And, you know, we're all experts in respective areas and we have to lean on each other to, to you know, have some real solutions to these problems. That's great, brother. Oh, yeah. Appreciate that, man. And you are so right, man. The, 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 the idea that we all come together on at least, at least one or two, you know, you said three, but at least one or two centralized themes that we know are the root of the problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. Until that happens, we're gonna we're gonna just be dealing with band aids. Exactly, band -aids. because really, uh, violence but, violence is a symptom. Actually, sure, it is. Absolutely. Violence is a symptom of an underlying cause. It's just how you act out whatever mm -hmm. issues that you're dealing with, and so. Until this is a public health crisis on a national level that opens up additional resources from the government, you know, because nonprofits and somebody mentioned this earlier, nonprofits fight against each other because there's a limited number of resources available. So we're competing for grants. We don't want to give anybody else any shine because we don't want them to get the money that we don't want to get. So, you know, I'll yeah. stop there. So, so, so that part of that means we might need to not expect to get those grants and, and get our our own resources moving in the right direction, right? Where we're doing it internally. Bob, I'm gonna come to you and then we're gonna have to wrap up, man. We're way over eight o'clock already, but go ahead. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be real quick. You said three things and forgive me, I might, you said three things. Do you have three specific things in mind? And one more question. The masjid, the mosque, the church, these institutions are sitting there six days a week, most of them, and they, they have they have the ear, they have the, the building. They, oh, does anybody, is anybody reaching out to these churches and mosques and masjids and these preachers and saying, look, we need you right now. I haven't heard much from the church since COVID hit. Maybe I'm just out of the loop. But yeah, those three things, Brother OG, and has anybody reached out to these religious institutions to see what is their buy-in. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, there are, you know, we are in, we go into the community where we may partner with the church to do peer-to-peer -peer grief counseling um, in the setting. So yes, there are churches that work with nonprofit organizations. We work with them. Um, you know, I, we'll work with any institution regardless of religious background um, but there has to be it has to be um, the institution has to have the best interest of the community first right it can't be an institution that we can partner with because they have great re uh, name recognition and you know a lot of organizations and institutions that come around if it's a high profile homicide but are you going to be there three months after this high-profile homicide? When the camera's so, on, right? 
Exactly. So when the cameras go off, and, and unfortunately, we when the in our organization, it's all right. We know this is high profile. Reach out to the families. Let's build our trusting relationship. We also understand ten or fifteen other individuals or organizations will step in. Let's make sure we're there in two to three months after the the cameras go away, because we know that's when the trauma really sets in with the families, because you know, they're caught up with the cameras in front of them, everybody reaching out, they're talking, they're distracted. And then when the cameras are gone, that's when the trauma really sets in for them. So yes, we do partner with those levels of organizations. Yeah. But it's not, it's not that conversation where we're sitting down there and we're creating plans, long-term plans to have true impact. I, you know, I've, I've been in the job for a year now. Um, so one band, one sound. You know, super simple. We, that we're not at that level yet, in my opinion. Gotcha. Great stuff, man. I think I think those areas that we look at, you know, we look at things to galvanize around. You talk about education. You talk about um, um, fiscal responsibility. So you know, uh, um, our <laughs> within the community, um, and then of course everybody being civically engaged. Um, because I think that once people see black men doing this work, we're natural to want to do it with them, right? It's what happens with our young folks. We've seen that in Black Man Lab. So, um, look, man, we are so far over time, but I want again, this is our last one of doing this, so I'm being a little selfish right now. I'm gonna Joe, Joe is gonna get mad at me because I had I'm not ending it just yet, but I want what we do every week is we also ask our panelists. What are your habits, rituals, and disciplines that you do on a daily basis that help you to move forward every day and doing the work that you do? And the reason that we want to know that is because hopefully one of our young folks is out there and they hear something that they can pick up on that keeps them driving forward, right? So I'm going to ask you guys each, your habits, rituals, and disciplines that you do on a daily basis that keep you moving forward and doing the work that you do and just being the person that you are, whether that's as a father, whether that's you know, as a husband, whatever, the stuff that keeps you moving forward. So, um, Brother Kine, I'll start with you, man. You've been through this before. You know about habits, rituals, and disciplines. What are yours? Well, I have three, and I form the acrostic WOW, W-O-W. First thing, man, waking up every day and working out. I don't care if it's just doing some push-ups or something, get that blood flowing right there, man, doing some crunches, walking. That's what I started back doing recently, walking, like trying to get my five miles in every day. Once I come back from working out, then I got to organize my thoughts or whatnot, get my calendar set right, make sure I'm organizing my day, organizing my week, organizing how I want to finish the day off. And then lastly, writing. That's the big thing I'm taking on now, Brother Marty. Um, I'm writing on a book right now, um, a nonfiction book called Seven Secrets to Inspiring and Empowering Black Boys. And then I'm working on a fiction book called A Walking Contradiction. So I feel like if I can just get my students, and I let them see me doing it sometimes, a student might come in and say, no, Ms. Walt, so you think about it, you, you ought to uh, add this character right there into the book. See, like somebody said, I think Joe said it earlier, if they can't see it, they can't be it. So if my students know that I'm working out and I show them that, hey, man, I got to get rid of this stomach right here or whatnot, then they get a chance to see that. If they know that one of my weaknesses, because a lot of times they think us as educators, we don't have weaknesses. If they know that I'm focusing on working on organizing my day every single day so that I can be better prepared for them as scholars as well as better prepared for my family and friends and so on and so forth, they get a chance to see that. And lastly, like I said, if they get a chance to see black men writing, Miley just published his own book, man, and I mentioned it on a broadcast that I was on recently. Once they see black men writing, black boys start saying that, man, I don't like to write no essays. No, I like to write books. <laughs> Y'all didn't catch that. I don't like to write essays. I like to write books. You know what I'm saying? I like to monetize my knowledge right now. So even though I might not be an A student in the school, I want to monetize my knowledge out there in the real world where I'm self-educating and not self-medicating. So wow, one more time in closing, I work out, I organize, and I write. That's my daily habits and rituals. That's great stuff, Walk. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Wow. I'm going to have to remember that one. Right. I remember that. Uh, Baba, how about you? Your, your habits, rituals, and disciplines. Oh, man. Of course, meditation, wake up, give thanks. You know, folks lay their clothes, clothes out every night. Some of them don't wake up. Absolutely. Wake up, you better give thanks. You ain't had to be here. But in, in my faith, it says, 
sleep is the cousin to death. So don't forget that. Mm. Uh, I kind of map out what I'm going to do. Yeah, I, I do the same thing, Brother King. I've been doing 50 push-ups every day long as I can remember and sit-ups. And I just started running. Thank you for that, Brother King. Help me remember that. Um, I just started running them up about seven miles per, per, uh, per run. Mm. Oh, man, I shot myself. I used to run track in high school. It came back to me. Wow. Uh, and, uh, and, and eating right. Garbage in, garbage out, fellas. And, and I owe that to my queen. She be on me, boy. Eat right. You can't get nothing good out if you're putting garbage in. Uh, mm. I'm not trying to get everybody to go vegan. Go vegetarian. Cut back on some of the meat. You know, if, there's, if you're putting something that's dead in your body, what you think going to come out? So, wow. Living food, man. Living food for living beings. That's about it, y'all. That's great stuff, man. I'm, I got I to gotta get back to you. You said you're doing seven a day? I can do seven miles straight, man. I shot myself. Man. One day I just said, you know how you had that, you had that wall? And yeah. you just say, nope, I ain't going to stop. Uh -huh. I can do seven miles straight. I shot myself, brother. Uh, you 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 inspire me, brother, because I don't run for nothing, brother brother <laughs> brother OG knows I we used to hoop. So uh, back when I was in Chicago, I hooped every weekend, and since I've been down here in Atlanta, <laughs> hooping stopped. And my knees my knees my knees are telling me you can't run, old man. So I I gotta figure out something, man. I try, I try. I do my yoga Get every day. Get your bicycle, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you, brother. I'm gonna get that. <laughs> I gotta get that. I gotta do something. You're right. You're right. I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm okay, but I ain't where I need to be. That's for sure. Like I said, brother OG, he, he used to he used to put it on me on the court. So, OG, since I'm talking about you, man, how about you? Habits, rituals, and disciplines, bro. Yeah. Um, so consistent with you know the last two young men that spoke. Uh, exercise uh but more recently including my family and exercising so going to the gym with my girl getting my daughter to the gym with us or working out with her at home just you know trying to do as much stuff together with the family and then just family time you know making sure that it's built in family time to build that connection um, and then self-wellness and that's a combination i'm trying to get back into reading i you know unfortunately buried myself in my job and so I have to break away. Self-care is important. So reading, um, eating healthy, you know, cooking as a family, yoga. I've been doing that for about 20 years on and off. So I'm getting back to that because my body is demanding it. And then uh, last is entrepreneurship. We talked about economics on the call. So, you know, really looking for more entrepreneurial uh, opportunities in the city that can help me and my family, but also help communities. That's beautiful, man. I love that, man. And and, and I hear you on the, the yoga thing, man. Um, crucial, crucial. Yeah. Like I, it. You know, since stopping playing basketball, I was, you know, doing nothing. But I'm mm -hmm. not, again, my knees are so bad, I can't run. Um, and the hills, that's the other thing. I got a bike, but the hills here in, in Atlanta, <laughs> man, I ain't ready. So I, I'm just being honest. We, <laughs> You know, we call we call the black man lab a, a safe and sacred space. So here I am being honest. I can't handle the meals. Not yet. You know, I'm gonna get there though. I'm gonna get take there. Take your bike, take your bike to a track at a high school and you just go around and around that circle, man. That's an idea. I'm gonna take that yep. with you, Baba. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh brother Carlos, how about you? Your habits, rituals, and disciplines, bro. I would say first pray. I like to pray and meditate. Mm -hmm. walk where I get to think my thoughts and then the third thing I like to do when I get up and before I go to sleep I look at my vision board so I know what I'm trying to get to and what I've accomplished those are the three things I do that's that's good stuff there man my my, my woman is big on the vision board so she has it up in our in our room and I done looked up and she done accomplished pretty much everything on that daggone vision board. And she told me I should have made one. And uh, now, now I feel like I got to listen because uh, she was right. So, 
women tend to know stuff that we don't. I guess and that's how that goes. Yes, that's so true. <laughs> Brother Cartel, how about you? Your habits, rituals, and disciplines, bro. Well, I'll put you like this. I'm I'm a flight attendant, so my my daily lifestyle is like I'm in and out of everything. You know what I mean? Um, I try to cold. I'm I also cold too. So I try to code as much as I can in the morning. That actually takes my mind off of everything, you know, just my project, whatever project that I'm doing. Um, but outside of that, it's kind of hard for me to have a, a daily ritual because my days vary so often. I travel like crazy. I, I actually work for American, not so much for the job per se, because I make way more money coding, but I do it for the flight benefit. So I like travel constantly all of the time um so i would say my mo my only ritual would be cold good stuff man well that's 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 a heavy duty uh ritual right there because that ritual is oh, bringing yeah. some money so good but stuff. It's, and it's and it's fun and it's fun i, I wish i could say that um <laughs> <laughs> i couldn't tell you a thing about it but good stuff brother we're gonna have <laughs> we you. we've had we've had a Black man lab on on coding before, so we need to bring you back when we do that again, man. So, oh, that's what's up. yes, sir. So, listen, brothers, um, the conversation tonight was great. Um, you guys are gonna go down in history as the last of our virtual, and I, and I say this, I say this with, with much humility, um, the last of our virtual, uh, uh, black man labs, and hopefully, we won't have to ever do it again like this because we will be able to be in the same space um, all the time. But what we are doing um, is we are um, going to have a new um, virtual space that we're gonna be in. It's gonna be called Lab Results. Black Man Lab presents Lab Results. So it'll be once a week, um, every Wednesday. And what Lab Results is gonna be is a more in-depth interview, one-on-one -on -one interview with somebody from our topic from the Monday. Um, so let's say like this week, we talked about violence in the community. We're not doing one this Wednesday, we'll start next Wednesday. But if we did, we'd have, you know, maybe one of you guys on or, or somebody else um, from around the country that deals with violence in the community to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation to find out what they're doing in that work that they do, but then also more about the person. Because here's the thing. We know that we all got hellified stories as Black men, don't we? We know that, right? Our, our stories for what got us here are just incredible. Every single one of us, we know that. So um, our young folks and our, our communities need to know about them. They need to know about the stories. They can be inspired. But then also so that they can say, hey, I know that I can get there. Right, um, Car Cartel, you had a great story, man. You tell you you do what you do, and you know you said you didn't graduate. That's you know that happens. That happens, but they still didn't stop your success. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm I'm actually in college right now. I'm actually back in college right now for Cause coding. You Cause you can, I'm, I'm a self taught coder, but I got a friend. So you all from Chicago? Do y'all remember Roddy Williams? I'm not familiar with him. He went to St. Alvey with me okay. and Carlton Lowe's. Okay, okay. Uh, okay. He's a year behind us. Yes. Uh, Vice President of Microsoft. Wow. Wow. There you go. That's the story, right? That's the story. So, well, yeah. So, he, he he introduced me to a couple of people, Netflix. I went out to his house a couple of years ago, and they said, hey, look, get uh, you know, I've already, I'm already had the uh, experience. Get the paper in it, and they'll get me in. So, that would, would be back in school. Gotcha. Great stuff. Baba, what you got there? I just, this is one book that I highly recommend to actually, not just the brothers, but the, the, the single mothers. Vision mm -hmm. for Black Men by Dr. Naeem Akbar. This is my signed copy. It's all beat up. I got it from him. You better, you better put it. that in, in, uh, in protection. Man, brother, you got to everybody. It's a, it's a short read. Look at that. Yep. You've got to read this book. It puts everything in. I saw Brother King give me some, some, some props over there, man. Get this book. Read it. It's a one-day read. And it's I called what? You, what is it called? Vision for Black Men by Dr. Naeem Akbar. 
you've got to get this book. And, and again, it's highly recommended reading for sisters raising boys and, 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 and men, single fathers raising boys. It's just a great all-around book. Great stuff. Great stuff. Um, so that's it, brothers. We've we've uh, we've we've spun it all out, man. We did all we could tonight, man. We took this last one to as far as we could, man. Brother Joe, you got anything you want to add before we sign off? Man, go on, get out of here, man. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, you so hey, to you. Mark Lawson. I see Mark Lawson. Who is Mark Lawson? Mark is a producer that's been cussing us out this whole time because we yeah. Over. Mark is our Mark. producer. Yeah. Mark, Mark is the Thank man behind the scenes. Okay, he's constantly keeping us moving, man. He's he's the man. Another so, link in this chain. That's what I'm about to do, Mark. I'm about to do it right now. I got you, brother. <laughs> I'm sorry. You see, he's trying to wrap me up. So every week, y'all, we end the same way. If we were in person. Um, we get together and we do this in the tradition of Queen Mother and Jiri Algani, um, who was one of the, the leaders of the Pan-African Pan uh, organization um, in Cobra. And what she would do is everybody would link arms and they'd say, I'm a link in this chain and it won't break here. So we do this every week at Black Man Lab. We're gonna do it here tonight virtually. Oh. We've been doing for the past whatever uh, since the beginning of COVID, we do this virtually. So if I could ask everybody to put your arms up, brother Cartel, I know you're driving. It's gonna be, you got one arm. That's cool. Um, <laughs> and then just repeat after me. I am a link in this chain. I'm a link, I'm a link in, this in this chain. chain. And it won't break here. And it won't, it won't break, break here. here. I'm a link in this chain. I'm a I'm link, link in this chain. chain. And it won't break here. And, and it won't. Right here. Right here. We are linked in this chain. We, we are linked in this chain. chain. And we won't break here. And we, and we won't, won't break, break here. here. I say. I say. I say. I cannot thank y'all enough for tonight. Um, again, we went way over our time, but it was well worth it. I think we shared a whole lot of good information tonight. I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, Brother Joe, thank you, man, for being here with me every week. Mark, man, you've been amazing. Thank you. So we will we'll see you again on Wednesday nights uh, with, with um, Lab Results. Black Man Lab presents Lab Results. And um, I'm sure at some point I may reach out to some of you guys to have you on to interview you all and hear about you all's lives that could inspire somebody else, man. So thank you so much. Love y'all. It was a pleasure meeting everybody. Thank you so much, Mark. Love you, brothers. Love you, brother. Nice to right. everyone. Stay safe, hey, good, Marty, everyone. Stay safe. Mark Lawson, you the man. <laughs> hey, Marty, Marty. Just yes. for those brothers who are Sigma, I started the show by talking about my student for the Sigma, the brother who I was talking about who was shot six times. They had to remove his kidney. They had to remove part of his intestine, part of his doggone um, liver. That brother right there happened to be an undergraduate brother of Phi Beta Sigma, even though I raised him in my organization, Brother wow. Building Up Brother. So I would love to reach out to those brothers right there because that divine nine piece that um, Brother West talked about, Here's where I'm not an alpha. I'm his big brother. I'm his jagna. I'm his mentor. And I'm not trying to reach uh -huh. out to alphas to help out. I'm reaching out to the whole divine nine because if we just reach one, yep. reach out for just one, hopefully that will domino effect into other brothers who have organizations and whatnot because it's bigger than Sigma and Alpha. We're trying to save black boys. So I just want to shout that out and put that on you guys front of your mind. Absolutely. Okay. All right, brothers. Thank you again, man. Mellow